will this be this conference will now be recorded. Sorry. Some will be some will be lighter. Some will be little blog posts. Four things you can do to get on top of your data problems. Some will be more look a little more meaty. And white papers are the things that look the most meaty. White papers and ebooks and maybe webinars are all things that they're forms of content that business to business companies put out. So to bring this a little bit down to earth here, net. NetScout here is talking to, shall I, sh I'd like to share my screen now. Sure, let me give you control, Gordon. Okay, because I've just got their, their white paper up here, right? So not sure where I clicked to do that or if you can do that for me. I'm trying to do it. I think it's. Oh, sorry. I'm looking at the wrong screen. I have two. There we go. Okay, that looks like me. Okay, that looks like me. So, here's their here's their white paper. And if we just look at the title of this white paper, what are they talking? Oh, back to my mug, which I don't want. But I apologize, Gordon. <laughs> You're, you're our guinea pig. You oh, that's. We're, we're just looking after our four guinea pigs for our neighbors while they're in holidays, and they're really <laughs> easy to look after. <laughs> Good. Okay. I'll give control. I'll share. Okay. So we're seeing. There we go. Now we got it. Excellent. Okay. So. The title of a white paper gives you a lot of clues to what it's about. And so what do we see here? Smart data provides the missing link for operators, digital transformation. When I looked at that first, I, I didn't have a clue what that meant. Did anybody, did any of you know what that meant? Yeah. Like it, it, well, from yeah. just the wording, um, like missing link, it's obviously a proposal of something they're trying to sell you. And yep. towards digital transformation, it kind of goes into uh, like a product that would help you integrate uh, whatever whatever you're doing into like a more online world. So whether it be like analytics or something, that's more uh, you'd have easier ways to do that digitally in some way or whatever. Very, very good. Very good. Very, very good. Um, so smart data must be something that they're that they're pushing as some kind of product that provides the missing link to an operator. The thing that got me was operator. What's an operator? You know, it, it, you know that could that could be several different things. And then digital transformation. Those are kind of fuzzy terms. So it starts off good, but about halfway through, I I just got lost and uh, had to read it a few times to know who, who they're trying to address and what they're trying to talk about. But um, the person that would get, that would Google and get this, this white paper would be looking for some kind of way to get ahead of the digital transformation. If they happen to use that term, this would probably come up pretty well. And actually, if you see a big list of search results and you see a white paper, that starts off smart data provides the missing link. It's you'd probably think, oh, maybe that's got some information. It, it's it it sounds more substantial than some silly piece of clickbait that's like seven things you must do to, you know, implement smart data or something. So, you know, they've got they've got a not bad uh, title here. But um, I think that I the uh, executive summary was so dense I couldn't make very much of that but I want to go over to this infographic that I think you should have or Kim Kim can give you this and this is the infographic that I did for my book I think I can move that little guy out of there and uh, and show you this that after after I had written a hundred white papers and I started going back through them and think gee I should I should like get some samples together I should have all, all those in some some folder and as i was looking at them i always believed what everybody else said that that there's 
you know, eight or 10 different types of white papers. And some people say there's 40 different types of white papers. Boy, that's enough to fry, fry anybody's brain. But then I thought, as I was looking at these things, I thought, boy, they really fall into this pattern. They really fall into these three big patterns, you know? And the first one is the one that your classmate was talking about, what I call a backgrounder. It's really a look at the features and benefits of some kind of product or service aimed at from one business to another. So it's B2B. It's, it just looks at the product itself. And these are the way every white paper used to be. Every single white paper was like this. Um, these have been around for more than 100 years, but after World War II, they really uh, started to get, um, as, the, as the technology uh, industry grew, they started to become more and more essential. And in the 80s and 90s, they just became really uh, practically a required uh, element in, in for any company selling anything technical. And these days, um, they're, they're very, very popular. For the past, uh, since the year 2010, the survey by the Content Marketing Institute every year has shown that about two out of three B2B companies use white papers. So these are not these are not some crazy, very rare um, type of document. These are very very common and very very popular because I think they they promise they promise some some meat and not just a not just uh, an advertising, you know, blurb or, or a, 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 a thinly veiled brochure. A good white paper has some real content that you can get a hold of and and digest and use to see if if that can help you solve your your big big problem. So, but a backgrounder is really just all about a product. And here the second one, and I call that vanilla because it's kind of predictable. You know what you're going to get. Um, it's 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 you know just uh, very very standard and uh, um, not full of any surprises. And in the middle, I I uh, found a lot that are were kind of like more like clickbait numbered lists. You know, seven reasons why you should, seven things you should know, eight hidden gotchas of four things you must. You know, those are numbered lists, and uh, we're we've all been trained to um, appreciate those because they were they were in magazines for years and now they're all over the web so it's a it's a really popular format much um, much lighter and livelier I, I think I, that's why I call the uh, numbered list strawberry because they're very light and live there's a numbered set of tips or points or questions and they don't have to develop much of a logic right you can kind of say i think of these as you can kind of say and what about this and what about that oh and another thing and you know what you ever think about this it's just they're all over the place and you can have a a set of points about some topic and make a pretty lively um uh paper out of them so that's another format of white paper which is the least uh kind of the least uh heavy um but really the most fun and then the kind of opposite to the vanilla is the chocolate and this is what i call a problem solution and these these began to be produced in the 80s and 90s and and now they're they're very popular but they are challenging to do so a a problem solution will talk about a major big business problem and why it's never been solved up to now and what you can do to solve it a new improved solution but it doesn't go into all the same detail as the vanilla. It it just sort of introduces the idea and there can actually be a follow-up white paper in the vanilla format that talks in more detail about a product. And uh, I call this chocolate because they're, they're rich, they're dense, they're heavy, they're satisfying, um, they're complex, much more so than the other two flavors relatively the same length, but they have some they have some specific sections that that you can find. And they're used a problem solution is really used at the top of the so-called sales funnel. Are you familiar with that idea from from marketing? It, it it's the idea that somebody um, when they're shopping for something uh, something big uh, and in in most cases uh, this applies more to business to business. So they're shopping is up for something big. They understand that they're 
their lunch is being eaten by their competitors. They have to buy something to help them analyze their data better, their customer data and their transaction data, all the stuff talked about in this white paper. At the, at the start, they have to acknowledge that they have a problem anyway and see who's out there that could, that could conceivably solve it. So this is the, the place at the top of the funnel where a problem solution is uh, very useful and defines a new improved solution to a big problem. Um, in the middle, you can use a numbered list. As, as people um, go down the funnel, the idea is that they continue to find out more. They winnow down their lists of possibilities. They, bring, they get it down to a short list um, of maybe three possible vendors. But this could take a few weeks, and there's a lot of people involved. See, the difference between B to C, business to consumer and business to business, business to, con to consumer, you can go buy a frozen pizza. You know, it's no big deal. You can, you can buy, you know, uh, a new surfboard. It, it, you know, if you have the money, you just go buy it. You don't, you don't want to read about it. Consumers don't want to read a lot. Um, the biggest decisions we make are really buying cars and buying houses. And for that, we may look at a little bit of information. But we're not going to sit there and Google and, and download a bunch of white papers and, and read them. In, in most cases, like buying a big appliance, say, you might look at consumers' reports. But you, we would look at one article from consumers reports or do a bit of googling and then say okay that's the that's the washing machine for me or that's about how much they should cost or those are the features i need it's it's but you're making that decision yourself for your own household yourself and your partner probably um in a business to business uh, purchase you have you may have six eight ten twelve people all in a big buying committee and they're all coming to meetings and this may take six months it may take 12 months and so during that time the middle of the funnel you have to keep as a vendor you have to keep the everybody on that committee engaged you don't just hit them once with one white paper you have to keep producing content for them and technical writers are great at, at doing all this and then at the bottom of the funnel is the brat the backgrounder the vanilla when they've when they've got it down to three possible choices um, then they'll ask, they'll start asking for white papers that are specifically about the product and somebody, it will be their job to analyze these three products. And the first place they'll start with is the white paper. So if a company doesn't have any white paper uh, in the vanilla format and the other two do, what do you think happens? Ooh, mm, that's, ooh boy. The, the one with no white paper for the, uh, um, at the bottom of the funnel is probably off the list probably just off the list. So you can see on the next bit of this um, infographic, I've, I've talked about what you put into each of these, each of these um, papers. And when you look at this one, when you look at the backgrounder, okay, it's got the cover, it's got an introduction or executive summary like this, uh, but then it's got features and benefits, and then it's got the conclusions and the, about the company, that's about it. Does that does that map onto what this is doing here? Does that map on an introduction to impact and opportunities? Customer experience, oh, man, oh boy. Um, visualize this, the power of automation, how communication service product can excel. Mm, that doesn't really sound like this, does it? Numbered list, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine things you should know. Doesn't really sound like that. What about this, the problem solution? Cover, executive summary. Maybe I'll move this guy over. Business or technical problem. Hmm. Business or technical problem. Having a massive impact. Uh, okay, big opportunity. Uh, the first wave didn't uh, help companies. Uh, uh, let's see, visualize automation. Uh, what can we learn? Static data doesn't tell the whole story. Static data doesn't tell the whole story. Hmm. You know, when I look at this paper, I think that it's closer to being a problem solution than anything else. It talks about a problem. It talks about the, too much data. The data is hard to dig into. It's not smart. It talks about a better solution. 
and look at all the benefits of the better solution. This page I thought was the best page of the whole paper because they have clearly, they clearly can articulate uh, the benefits of their product. <laughs> they can't quite as clearly communicate uh, the problem it's supposed to solve, but um, here's one. CSPs need to gain immediate and greater insight into what impacts their customers' behavior. So, you know, I'm kind of thinking this one is a problem solution that where the parts are not really crisply defined and laid out. There's a little bit of a little bit of a back and forth here. But if I had to split this up into blog posts, I would probably look for these kind of sections that are in a problem solution. I'd probably look for those, you know, and say, is there a part of this white paper I could pull out and call it the business or technical problem? Is there a part I could pull out that talks about the existing solutions? Is there a part I could pull out that talks about the better solution? And the buyer's guide is a really neat feature, which is kind of missing from this one. A buyer's guide basically says what to look for in an ideal system. And you would kind of put that up. Maybe you, maybe you could, you know, maybe you could say this is that, eh? Hmm. Let's see. So if you could enable automation orchestration, enable real-time, maybe this is the buyer's guide, which says what you, sh what you need to look for. And it's kind of a standalone section, right? Like, hmm, you could you could make this into a blog. Could you make could you make this into a blog post and say like, now that we under now that you're reading uh, sec uh, blog three of our four part series, hmm, here are the benefits you your company could gain from making from acquiring a smart data solution. Hmm, bing, 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 bing. Hmm. Hmm, conclusions and about the company, conclusions. Oh, okay, conclusions. I don't know if that stands alone as a blog post, but whenever I have to repurpose a white paper, I really look for how I can split it up into these sections and pull out something that stands alone that, that is it kind of provides a, a, a little nugget or enough enough detail or enough meat that it's worth reading as a standalone blog post. So I guess I guess that's my advice I would give to you about this. Um, and and let me let me interrupt you for one second, Gordon. So the the reason that I asked Gordon to talk you through reading this thing and specifically to talk about repurposing this as blog posts is because that's what your teams are going to do and um, NetScout uh, is available to answer questions for you and they will publish with your names any really good blog posts that come out of this so this is not just a course project you have, you have the potential here to create something, even if NetScout decides that they're not going to publish the blog post, you have something that you can put in your portfolio, um, your employment portfolio, that you can show off to employers and say, you know, we took this content and we repurposed it. So the, the advice that Gordon's giving you is exact spot on. This is what I needed for him to tell you about. Um, well, good. Are there other uh, tips that you want to leave them with? I'm going to make sure they have a copy of the blog post that you you've got on uh, your blog about repurposing mm -hmm. white paper content. I I I would just say that um, it's an underused technique in content marketing. Content marketing is very new and and technical communicators are ideal at doing it, just absolutely ideal, because content is not supposed to be a sales pitch. And, you know, I was a, I was a former journalist, became a content writer, or, or sorry, a technical writer. In both of those fields, you have to talk, you have to talk about what's real. 
it's it's not just you're not just making stuff up you're not just talking about feelings or something you're you're trying to get down to real facts with real people and times and dates and places and sources and all that all that you know so with that orientation you are uh in a great position to write content and content is a is a huge 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 trend in b2b marketing um and repurposing is something that's not done as much as it should be so i generally say start with a white paper and use that to put in your best research and your most persuasive argument and your and your most compelling wording and when you've done all that work in your white paper then doesn't it make sense to reuse some of that and recycle some of that and split it up into um, into blog posts or write other formats the um, uh, press release is a really simple thing to do for a for a white paper you can repurpose a white paper as a set of slides and if you're interested in working with uh, more visuals or shorter text slide decks are fun because you, you know some people say you get four bullets and four words per bullet per slide and that's it and put a big picture on the slide and, and that's it per slide so uh, to to repurpose something like this as a as a slide deck would be would be really super um, and then that slide deck can be used to guide people through a webinar, and then that can be recorded and put up as a as a free uh, a free sort of watch when you want to um, webinar or slide share. It just goes it just really goes on and on, and we and we haven't even talked about social media. So if you, I think this is a great exercise to do, and I would just look for the the kind of natural divisions in terms of uh, repurposing this as a blog post the natural divisions the big the big fractures lines the big points where you could separate one chunk from another of this and you know ideally what you want to do is just take the text that's there write a little bit at the top write a little bit at the bottom and go there's our blog post number 1 and at the end of number 1 goes for more in this series see blog post number 2 and then you put the number 2 and it would it should follow through in the same order as the white paper now that's if you're dealing with a really, really crisp, clear, organized white paper in the first place. And and with this sample, and it's a good one to work on, the the dividing points aren't that clear. And you might want to cut and paste and rearrange things a little bit. So there's one thing I wanted to just show you for sure, um, which is over. On, it's the one about how can we, yeah. Right here, this section here, what can we learn from traffic data? It, it, I don't think it should have been on this page. I think it should have been another page because when you read down through this, at the end of this previous section and to, over to this section, there's a, a big jump. This is a kind of proof with some external sources, which are always good, that, um, Better data, you know, affects the customer experience and keeps customers happier. That's a blog post in itself, right there. You know, it's short, but maybe you could extract more from these um, from these external sources, right? They're given it, it's given just uh, you know a couple of paragraphs. Maybe you could take some more out of there. Maybe you could find another source that that sort of backs up this one. So. In a case like this, I wouldn't simply, you know, start with what's here. But if you can pull out a piece that's only half of a blog post long, you might think about doing a little more research and and bolstering the argument a little bit with some other sources. So I guess that's my last my last point here. And I hope that I hope that this is a a, a fun exercise for you and and that you go from thinking what the heck is this thing I'm looking at to to seeing how you could chunk it up and uh, and actually even without understanding every word at least understand the structure and the big chunks of it that you could pull out and uh, and deliver as blog posts this is terrific Gordon one of the one of the reasons I thought this was a good project to start with for these students is because if you're not comfortable reading material you don't understand you're not going to make it in the field 
because you're going to read a whole lot of content you don't understand. And you're going to produce content that you don't necessarily understand fully. Um, because that's not your job. You're not the engineer or the developer or the, you know, but you've got to be the bridge between the people buying and the people selling. So that's a really good good point, Kim. And I can tell you an anecdote just from today. I was I was talking to a bunch of engineers on a on a project, and they had been working on this for months. And they have a they have a diagram. So we're looking at the diagram. It's all got all these lines and boxes and stuff. And they start saying, I don't really know if we need that one. And then I say, Yeah, yeah, I don't know if you need that one or that one or that one either. And then a whole bunch of them jump jump in and say, Yeah, I was wondering what that one up there is doing anyway. Do we really need that? So we ended up like they they had sat there with this for at least six months, this diagram with stuff all over the place that was not part of the message that just confused everything. It was supposed to be a standard diagram of a standard configuration for um, a blockchain uh, um, performance evaluation or benchmark. And it had these, these at least four boxes that were like, and I was saying, okay, what does that one mean? What does that one mean? Now let's write a little definition of each one of these, shall we? So the thing is you have to get used to asking pesky questions. But what you ask as a pesky question, maybe something that a lot of other people are thinking, or when you ask it, you know what you want to hear? You want to hear when you ask a question to an engineer, you want to hear them say, that's a really good question, you know? Maybe we don't need that thing. Maybe we don't need this. Maybe we could simplify that. Maybe yeah, there's a better way of describing that. So never be afraid of asking questions and saying, I don't get this. I don't get what this means. I mean, if you're, uh, you know, I do believe there are some stupid questions you can ask. If, if you ask a question that's just too basic that you could have Googled and got the answer in, in 10 seconds, don't ask that. But when you're working with engineers, you, just, you can, you're quite free to say, I don't quite get that. That's not that clear to me. What are you talking about here? And what, what's this? There was one where there was another example in this paper where it said uh, the, the, for, the former, it said the former, well, blah, blah, blah. But in the very two sentences above that, there was four different items. So which is the former? Like, are you going back to the first one or the next one or the next one? So I said, which is the former? And like, oh yeah, I meant the, the third one, the fourth, second one in the list. Yeah, that, well, let's not call it the former. Let's like identify. So <laughs> your job is to make things clear to, anybody who is reading and uh, reading quickly. People read really quickly. They scan things these days too. So your job is to make things really, really clear. And I wish you great success doing that. Thank you so much, Gordon. Would you guys give him a round of applause? I wish I could keep you on the line and keep you going, but we have to move on to more stuff. So I just want to wave and say, I don't know if you can see. Huh? Oh, there I am. I'm waving, waving okay. goodbye. It's been good great. luck. Have a have a good have a good year, everybody. All right, great. Thank so, you. Think we got it.